Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Jeff Donovan. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today about new technologies in hair loss and what's around the corner. What are we now using in the clinic to treat hair loss? And what are some of the exciting emerging therapies that we should all be thinking about? I don't have any disclosures or conflicts of interest about any of the information I'll be talking about today. But what I would like to review with you today is some of the newer treatments for androgenetic alopecia, alopecia areata, and chemotherapy-induced hair loss. There are a number of exciting treatments in androgenetic alopecia, and in fact, over the last five years, the number of studies in androgenetic alopecia uh, from a company perspective has increased exponentially. And there are a number of companies that are very interested in studying androgenetic alopecia. And I'll review with you some of these studies, especially the ones that are around the corner, as well as some of the changes we're seeing in the clinic now for the treatment of androgenetic alopecia. We'll talk about some oral treatments, especially oral minoxidil, and we'll review some injection-based therapies, especially platelet-rich plasma. For alopecia areata, there's no treatment which has changed the way we treat alopecia areata more than the JAK inhibitors, and we'll talk about tofacitinib and ruxolitinib, and I'll also review with you platelet-rich plasma and its role in alopecia areata. Finally, for chemotherapy-induced hair loss, I'd like to review with you uh, two new FDA-approved treatments for preventing hair loss after chemotherapy, uh, and these are uh, scalp cooling devices that offer profound changes in the way that we treat and prevent hair loss in individuals undergoing chemotherapy. Let's start then with androgenetic alopecia. Male balding is common. Hair loss in females is common as well. By the age of 50, about half of men will experience male pattern hair loss. In 1987, we saw the approval of topical minoxidil. And in December 1997, we saw the approval of oral finasteride. But when you think about it, over the last 20 years, there has been no new FDA-approved treatments for androgenetic alopecia. And so the question then is, why is this? And why are we seeing the interest now? Well, there's a tremendous interest in new therapies. And what's driving the research in androgenetic alopecia? Well, it's this unmet need. Men and women certainly are still losing hair despite using finasteride, despite using topical minoxidil. Men and women are still losing hair. Either these therapies are not effective for them, or they have side effects on these medications, or they decide not to start, or they start these medications too far along in their hair loss course. Second is the side effects of finasteride. In the last five years, we've really entered a whole new era of finasteride-related side effects. We've come to realize that in a proportion of men, uh, there are concerns about uh, sexual dysfunction. There are concerns about the persistence of these side effects after stopping the medications. And so these have become very important questions that our patients have for us in the clinic. Uh, and they're important questions for all of us as physicians as well in terms of understanding uh, how common are these uh, symptoms and uh, what can we do to uh, prevent them and can we use these medications in a safer way in the clinic. And so it's because of this uh, that this unmet need exists and it's because of this that many uh, companies and uh, clinical research groups are interested in new therapies. So we'll talk about the five alpha reductase inhibitors in uh, treating androgenetic alopecia, especially the topical 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. We'll talk about the androgen receptor blockers, topical spironolactone, topical brazula, uh, and a number of others as well. And I'll introduce you to oral minoxidil and how we're increasingly using oral minoxidil in the clinic at very low doses. And then we'll talk about platelet-rich plasma and robotic hair restoration as well. There are a number of signaling pathways which are now recognized to be very relevant in androgenetic alopecia, including prostaglandin pathways, the Wnt pathways, and the JAK pathway. 
And there are specific drugs, specific pharmacologic agents that target these pathways. And I'll review these with you today in terms of the treatments that we have available for these pathways. So let's start then with the topical 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. You know, at first glance, it makes a lot of sense to use topical agents. The 5-alpha reductase activity is increased in the skin in those individuals who are balding. And so it makes sense to target the skin via topical treatments. However, the difficulty is getting these large molecules into the skin and a lot of compounded agents that are available on the internet or compounded agents that are prescribed through a pharmacy uh, may not in fact get into the skin. And so there's more to using topical agents than might appear at first glance. The topical 5-alpha reductase inhibitor that's received the most attention is topical finasteride. There are also studies in injectable dutasteride, which we won't review today, uh, simply because topical finasteride is the most commonly studied topical 5-alpha reductase inhibitor that's emerging in our clinics. And the studies in topical finasteride have shown us that it is in fact difficult to get this molecule into the skin and it is more complex than simply compounding uh, finasteride in propylene glycol, water and ethanol. And there are a number of uh, companies looking at technologies, including liposomal technologies, as well as other liquid crystalline nanoparticles to more effectively get finasteride into the skin. And so this is an important area. And what I'd like to review with you now is some data looking at how effective topical finasteride might be uh, in our patients. One of the earliest studies is this one in 2015. Uh, which looked at 0.1% finasteride compounded in minoxidil. Uh, this was a study of 45 men who were treated with oral finasteride and topical minoxidil for two years. After that two-year point, these 45 men were switched to topical finasteride, topical minoxidil uh, combination. What this study showed is that 84% of the men in this study maintained their density using topical finasteride, topical minoxidil, giving us perhaps hope that in men who are stabilized on oral finasteride, that perhaps some of them can be switched to topical finasteride, topical minoxidil, and maintain their density. Certainly an encouraging study. The Swiss company Polychem is very interested in studying topical finasteride, and this is a uh, a compound of theirs, P3074, which is topical finasteride made up in this hydroxypropyl chitosan. Uh, this is a film forming agent and hydroxypropyl chitosan is most well known by the company as a nail lacquer and used in uh, onychomycosis treatments as a means of getting uh, fungal agents into uh, the nail. And so studies have shown with this P3074 that uh, topical agents can reduce DHT levels quite effectively and in fact to the same level as the one milligram pill. And their study showed that low doses of topical finasteride could in fact reduce DHT in the scalp without reducing DHT significantly in the bloodstream. And so this is very encouraging because we believe that many of the side effects of finasteride are coming from DHT reductions at the level of the serum DHT. And so if we can reduce DHT in the scalp without affecting serum DHT, that could perhaps limit side effects. And so the company has a phase three clinical trial, of about 450 patients uh, thought to be completed sometime within the next uh, six months or so. Uh, and that will certainly be encouraging. And so let's look at the numbers. This is what the data would suggest to us. We know very well that oral finasteride can reduce serum DHT by about 70%. It reduces uh, scalp DHT by about 38%. That's from data that goes back you know, 20 to 25 years. What about topical finasteride? Well, these studies would suggest that serum DHT would be reduced only by about 25%, whereas scalp DHT would be reduced as much as 50%. So effective means of reducing scalp DHT uh, and less so on serum DHT. So it'll be very interesting to follow these studies that emerge with this topical agent. Uh, 
M-O-R-R-F, MORF-F, is a topical uh, minoxidil, topical finasteride um, product that is produced by Intus Pharmaceuticals in India. And it is a product which is readily available. Individuals can purchase it. And this was a study that was conducted with 104 patients using this MORF-F product uh, compared to minoxidil alone. And what that study showed is that 65% of individuals using this topical minoxidil, topical finasteride solution had an improvement in their hair density compared to just 25% of individuals using minoxidil alone. And the serum concentrations of finasteride were 10 times less using MORF-F compared to oral finasteride. So again, evidence that these topical finasteride agents uh, may be helpful in the treatment of androgenetic alopecia. What about the topical androgen receptor blockers? We've talked about the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. What about the topical androgen receptor antagonists? Well, there's much less evidence for these. You will see them used in the clinic. You will have patients that bring these in to the office to show you that they've purchased them on the internet or various means. There's less evidence for them. Topical spironolactone has been around for some time. It's been studied in acne. Um, there are 1%, 2%, and 5% solutions available. Uh, there's no good evidence at present that topical spironolactone has a, an impact on uh, androgenetic alopecia, uh, at least at any uh, published level. Most of it is completely anecdotal. Cortexalone 17 propionate brizula, or CBO301, uh, is a product which is uh, actively being studied by uh, a company. It is an androgen receptor antagonist, and there's phase one and two clinical trials uh, in place with 5% Brizula. Uh, and it'll be very interesting to um, know the results of these studies and whether this androgen receptor antagonist can in fact be used in the clinic. Uh, fluoridil, there are patients that bring in ampules, glass ampules of fluoridil. Uh, this is an androgen receptor uh, antagonist, which has very little systemic absorption. Uh, there's been small studies with fluoridil. We don't know uh, how well it works, but in a study of nine patients, there was no change in the diameter of hair follicles in users of fluoridil, but six of nine women using fluoridil reported that their hair was better. Um, and there's at least some evidence that uh, this could be helpful, but very small studies, and so we really don't know uh, what to make of this. Uh, but your patients will bring in fluoridil, uh, mainly uh, now as an off, uh, a non-approved indication, off-label indication, uh, mainly for research purposes. The same is true of RU58841. Proskelia um, bought the uh, drug as well and renamed it PSK3841. And there are phase uh, one, two clinical trials, actually studies of this drug dating back to 2002, 2003. Um, but uh, that data is not uh, readily available. But um, uh, certainly at the present time, this drug is available mainly for research purposes only. Uh, but patients do have access to it on the internet and uh, will bring it in. So it's helpful to know about our U588841. Um, we just saw a patient last week with uh, this compound uh, as well as fluoridil as well. What about minoxidil? Well, minoxidil has been around for a long time. It was FDA approved in 1979 for hypertension, refractory hypertension. 80% uh, of individuals that use oral minoxidil get hair growth. Uh, but oral minoxidil users are well known to have uh, ankle swelling, tachycardia. Uh, there may be other side effects as well, pleural effusion, shortness of breath. Uh, and so it's not an easy drug to use at the, at the doses that it's typically used in hypertension, which is 10 milligrams to 40 milligrams, even higher. And so uh, topical minoxidil was approved in 1987 uh, for an indication in androgenetic alopecia. Uh, and certainly topical minoxidil helps a certain proportion of uh, individuals, maybe 30%, to have some type of benefit. Uh, but compliance is an issue. Not all individuals are able to use this medication long term. It's not effective in everyone. And so are there ways that we can use minoxidil uh, more effectively in the clinic. Well, there are companies studying how to get minoxidil into the skin better. Uh, individuals are studying the use of derma rollers to get minoxidil into the skin. Um, niazomes are a technology, um, non-ionic surfactant vesicles 
to, to get minoxidil into the skin even better. These are still not in the realm of the clinic, but low-dose oral minoxidil is. And nobody knows uh, oral minoxidil better than uh, Rod Sinclair uh, in Melbourne. And um, Dr. Sinclair has studied uh, oral minoxidil for over a decade with uh, many thousand patients. Uh, and is really the leader in this area in understanding how to use oral minoxidil at very low doses. And by low dose, we mean 0.25 milligrams to 2.5 milligrams, sometimes higher. But this was a study of 100 patients that Dr. Sinclair did. Um, it's well known that spironolactone in combination with topical minoxidil provides benefit to women with androgenetic alopecia. What about oral uh, minoxidil at low doses? Well, this was a study of 0.25 milligrams, and this study showed that it, in fact, could uh, reduce shedding in these women, and it could help density as well. So very encouraging. Uh, Dr. Sinclair has also studied uh, more recently the use of oral minoxidil in chronic telogen effluvium, showing that doses up to 2.5 milligrams could reduce shedding in women with chronic telogen effluvium. So certainly oral minoxidil is very encouraging. There are uses in alopecia areata, there's uses in chemotherapy, uh, induced hair loss in hair shaft disorders, uh, so a very encouraging indication as well. What about platelet-rich plasma? Well, platelet-rich plasma is very popular. Uh, your patients may know quite a bit about it. Uh, I think it's important that we all know a lot about platelet-rich plasma uh, because there is some emerging data suggesting that it does benefit a certain proportion of individuals. There are many growth factors which are released from these alpha granules of the platelets, and these growth factors uh, have a positive effect on hair follicles, at least in vitro in vivo studies. They can induce proliferation of dermal papilla cells. They can reduce apoptosis of uh, dermal papilla cells through uh, upregulation of BCL2. They can promote differentiation of bulb stem cells um, through uh, elaboration of VEGF they can promote vascular structures in hair follicles as well. So a lot of basic science evidence to support that platelet-rich plasma can be beneficial for hair follicles. What about the clinical evidence? Well, if you're not familiar with PRP, this is how we typically do PRP. It's a very straightforward procedure where we take blood by venipuncture, anywhere from 10 mils to we take 120 mils of blood. And this blood can then be spun down in an ordinary high school centrifuge, or you can use various kits that are available. And we choose to use a kit for a number of reasons, sterility, and it gives us some um, um, uh, ability to measure PRP concentrations in these patients. Then you add it to a centrifuge. Here you can see the blood being added to a plastic sterile uh, bag in this machine. Then it's spun down, and 20 minutes later, we are gonna have PRP produced. From 120 mils of blood, we typically get about three to five milliliters of concentrated PRP, which is 17 times above baseline. We dilute it in platelet poor plasma to achieve a concentration between three and seven times uh, above baseline. We do use anesthesia, so here's some uh, lidocaine being injected into the scalp to provide freezing, uh, and then the PRP is um, introduced into the scalp. Six studies to date have looked at PRP with a placebo, and I think this is very important that we come to understand how PRP matches up against the placebo rather than just patient views on PRP. Uh, and to date there's been two meta-analyses, one in 2017, one in 2016, uh, looking at the role of PRP against placebo. Uh, the first study, Giordano, 2017, was a study of 177 patients, uh, showed that PRP increased the number of hairs per square centimeter and hair thickness. Uh, Gupta included uh, four patients into the meta-analysis that was conducted, uh, showing here via this graph that there was an advantage of PRP over placebo. So some evidence emerging that PRP indeed helps. This is a patient of mine. Uh, with androgenetic alopecia receiving PRP. These are results that we achieve in a small proportion of patients, uh, certainly a minority, about 20 to 30 percent of patients can achieve some very nice results with repeated PRP injections over time. It's very difficult to predict who responds to PRP. There's no really good predictor except someone who's in the early stages 
of androgenetic alopecia. Um, it can be used in other indications as well. This was a study of PRP and alopecia areata, which certainly caught my attention in 2013 and prompted our clinic to continue an interest in the use of PRP in alopecia areata. This is a study which was published in the BJD by Trink and colleagues. They studied um, uh, patients who were receiving PRP, patients that were receiving triamcinolone acetonide at 2.5 milligrams per mil and placebo. These injections were repeated monthly for three months, and then these patients were followed uh, over a year. And this graph shows the individuals that achieved remission or continual growing of their hair over prolonged periods of time. And yeah. what this study showed that uh, individuals receiving PRP injections into those defined areas of hair loss, that 60% of them maintained their hair growth uh, compared to only 27% with steroid injections. Keep in mind, again, this was 2.5 milligrams per mil, not 5 and not 10. Um, but nevertheless, an, an encouraging study that uh, PRP may have benefit in uh, alopecia areata. Uh, this was a patient of mine and one of the earlier uh, patients that we've had in our clinic with PRP. This was a patient with very refractory ophiasis, um, alopecia areata at the back of the scalp, which is traditionally quite resistant to treatment had not responded to topical uh, corticosteroids, had not responded to um, corticosteroid injections uh, without side effect, uh, nor minoxidil. And so we underwent uh, a protocol of PRP injections into this area. Uh, and after one month, uh, this individual was sprouting hair into this area. Certainly very encouraging um, that despite refractory um, treatments before, uh, this patient grew hair with PRP and has maintained for a prolonged period of time. What about prostaglandins? Prostaglandins are an extremely exciting area of emerging treatments in androgenetic alopecia. And I think an area that we're gonna hear a whole lot more about, and so I'd like to introduce you to the concept of prostaglandin-based treatments. There are a number of prostaglandins in the skin and in the scalp. Some of the most relevant ones to hair are prostaglandin D2 and prostaglandin F2 alpha. And they work differently in order to stimulate hair growth, we have to downregulate prostaglandin D2. And it's well known that in balding scalp, prostaglandin D2 levels are increased. And in order to stimulate hair growth, we have to increase prostaglandin F2 alpha. And we have drugs that target these pathways. Uh, prostaglandin F2 alpha analogs are very well known, latanoprost, bimatoprost, uh, Travaprost, these are uh, medications which are very well known in the treatment of glaucoma. Uh, Bimatoprost, of course, through the FDA approval of Latisse, is known for the treatment of eyelash hypotrichosis. Um, so we have these drugs available. What about the prostaglandin D2 blocking agents or inhibitors? Well, we have these drugs available as well, and I'd like to review with you uh, some of the literature and previous studies around this drug. Cetipiprint is a uh, prostaglandin D2 receptor inhibitor, which inhibits the GPR44. What about the prostaglandin F2 drugs? Well, latanoprost um, is a prostaglandin F2 alpha uh, drug. And this was a study in 2012 in 16 men with androgenetic alopecia where 0.1% latanoprost was dropped onto the scalp in very small regions and the growth of these hairs was studied over a 24-week time point. And it was very clear in this study that topical latanoprost could stimulate hair growth and enlargening of, uh, enlargement of hair fibers. Uh, Bimatoprost is a um, very encouraging uh, compound for the treatment of androgenetic alopecia. Um, some of the earliest studies with 0.03% uh, 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 bimatoprost and low-dose bimatoprost, including some of the randomized controlled trials here, uh, were disappointing. They showed that uh, bimatoprost was better than placebo, but not better than minoxidil in these early studies. But quite encouraging, uh, in data that Allergan has posted on their website in 2015, that higher doses of bimatoprost used twice a day rather than once a day in their earlier studies uh, was quite effective, and in these earliest studies that the company has put forth, uh, was as effective, maybe even more effective in some cases, based on these graphs, 
than minoxidil 5% twice a day. And so certainly encouraging that uh, bimatoprost may be an agent that we'll, we'll be hearing about in the future. What about cetipiprin? Well, cetipiprin is a prostaglandin D2 uh, receptor blocker. And what's very interesting about this drug is it's been used for many years. It's been studied by uh, Actelion Pharmaceuticals in over nine studies with over 1,000 patients in a safety database. This was initially studied as an allergy treatment, especially in airway disease. It was not brought to market. But this is a prostaglandin D2 receptor blocker. And Kythera uh, has acquired the rights to this medication um, through agreements with Actelion and uh, the University of Pennsylvania to study this uh, SETI piperant, uh, renamed as uh, KYTH105, and they're undergoing studies comparing it to oral finasteride in uh, randomized blinded studies against placebo. So it'll be very interesting, and they have the rights to study these prostaglandin D2 receptor inhibitors, and so whether it's SETI piperant or whether it's uh, uh, molecules that are um, redesigned based on the molecular structure of um, SETI piperant will be interesting, but nevertheless, this is a very active area of hair loss research in androgenetic alopecia, and I have no doubt that you'll be hearing about it more. No talk on emerging therapies and new treatments would be complete without a mention of robotic hair restoration. Um, the Artis robot is uh, FDA approved, approved in, in Canada as well. Uh, this is a robot in our office, and uh, it's a device which is able to extract hair follicles from the back of the scalp using image-guided technology. And um, the robot is now becoming much better at also putting these follicles into the front of the scalp. And so this technology, uh, especially the RTAS and Restoration Robotics, which is the main um, player in the field right now, is constantly modifying this technology. And um, robotic hair restoration will be increasingly a part of our surgical therapies in the future. And so we have these emerging treatments for androgenetic alopecia. We have these topical androgen uh, receptor blockers. We have the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, minoxidil, PRP. Um, the prostaglandin pathway is highly relevant. I didn't touch on the Wnt activators. There are preclinical uh, studies, especially a company called Samumed, which is studying these Wnt activators. And uh, the JAK uh, inhibitors are well known for alopecia areata, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the JAK inhibitors are being studied by Aclaris in terms of any sort of a role they might have in androgenetic alopecia as well. And so these are drugs that you'll hear about. What about alopecia areata? Well, no treatment has played more of a role in how we think about hair loss and how we treat hair loss than the JAK inhibitors. And there are several JAK inhibitors, tofacitinib, ruxolitinib, baricitinib, tofacitinib, and ruxolitinib are approved. Ruxolitinib for myelofibrosis, tofacitinib for rheumatoid arthritis. So they have FDA approved Health Canada indications already. So it gives us the ability to study them off label. And there's no doubt about it that these drugs help alopecia areata. And what is encouraging about these medications is they really provide the first specific treatment for alopecia areata, a targeted uh, JAK pathway based treatment. These are uh, a number of studies, six here, which are uh, open label type studies, reasonable size, which have shown that uh, both tofacitinib and ruxolitinib can be helpful in the treatment of alopecia areata. Um, these included a study of uh, adolescents as well. And so between 50% and 70% of individuals with uh, more advanced alopecia areata respond to these medications, uh, certainly encouraging uh, and uh, have provided options for our patients that have been refractory to topical treatments, injection-based treatment, anthralin, difencipro, and cyclospor, and methotrexate, methotrexate. Some of these patients are responding to tofacitinib. So an exciting treatment. Uh, there are safety issues around oral tofacitinib. We know it increases the risk of infection. There may be concerns long-term about immunosuppression, 
uh, risk of cancer, uh, elevation of muscle enzymes, hypertriglyceridemia, hypercholesterolemia, um, changes in blood levels of um, CBC, platelets, etc., can be altered in these patients as well, so monitoring is needed. And so there's been great interest in topical ruxolitinib, topical tofacitinib, and topical JAK inhibitors in general. And there are some studies which show that these medications can benefit some individuals with um, alopecia areata at a topical level. Is a patient of mine with refractory nail disease, alopecia areata, and nail disease. And this study showed that um, despite having this nail disease, oral tofacitinib at uh, 10 milligrams, 5 milligrams twice a day, could remarkably improve this individual's nails over a period of six to nine months. And so uh, a, a marked improvement in nails as well. Finally, we come to chemotherapy-induced alopecia. You may be well aware that hair loss during chemotherapy has a profound uh, psychological effect on patients. This is a very um, common reason uh, for patients to, in fact, um, consider not undergoing chemotherapy, is the hair loss that they will experience. Many patients with hair loss after chemotherapy will state that it is among the top uh, negative aspects of their chemotherapy. And so are there means by which we can reduce or prevent hair loss after chemotherapy? And what has been studied and what I'd like to introduce you to is these scalp cooling devices. The DignicaP and the Paxman device were approved in 2015 and 2017 as FDA cleared devices to prevent hair loss after chemotherapy. And you know, the concept of scalp cooling has been around since the 1970s. And certainly in Europe, there's been a lot of experience for well over a decade with scalp cooling. Um, but in 1990, the FDA banned scalp cooling, citing that there's really not enough evidence for its efficacy and there were safety concerns. And so in order for this uh, device to be cleared in the US, this had to go through this FDA approval uh, system or FDA clearance. And so the DignicaP study was a study where 101 patients uh, used the DignicaP and 67 of these 101 patients lost less than half their hair compared to all of the patients who are using, uh, not using the DignicaP device. These patients were breast cancer patients. Docetaxel, cyclophosphamide was the most common chemotherapy agent. In the Paxman study, there was 95 patients. And in that study, about 50% of patients lost less than half their hair. And what that means is that about half of these patients were able to go without wearing a wig, compared to hair loss in all patients who did not use this device. And so um, scalp cooling devices now are really the only means that has good evidence of preventing chemotherapy-induced hair loss. And so devices which are now uh, becoming much more common in cancer centers in North America and devices we'll be hearing a lot more about which are uh, helping tremendously to prevent hair loss after chemotherapy. What are the takeaway messages? Well, the takeaway messages are that we have a tremendous number of emerging treatments. Um, there's been no greater area of hair loss research where we've seen these treatments than in androgenetic alopecia. We're seeing the emergence of topical finasteride and evidence that it actually may help uh, in the treatment of androgenetic alopecia. Uh, oral minoxidil is increasingly used. It's increasingly used in my clinic as well. Evidence that PRP is helpful. Um, the topical uh, bimatoprost agents as well are very encouraging, and I have no doubt we'll see more of those. Uh, intense study with what is the role of JAK inhibitors, what is the role of Wnt activation in treating androgenetic alopecia, and, and we'll be hearing a lot more about that. Certainly early data is uh, interesting. As far as the um, JAK inhibitors go, uh, this is tremendously exciting. A targeted treatment for alopecia areata, and um, an interest now in what is the role of topical JAK inhibitors, topical tofacinib, ruxolitinib, and others. Um, and so we'll be hearing a lot more about that. And finally, for chemotherapy-induced alopecia, uh, the scalp cooling devices provides a very exciting uh, means to prevent hair loss after chemotherapy. 
and uh, we'll be hearing uh, certainly a lot more about this in North America uh, over the next few years. Uh, this ends the presentation today. I want to thank you very much for this kind invitation again, and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.